Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all the friends uh, of Digital Futures. It's a great honor today. We invite Mansat uh, Abazad, uh, who is from University of Pennsylvania, come to give us uh, another uh, special lecture in the Digital Consortium PhD program, a PhD, uh, PhD. And uh, the lecture series, the topic is performance-based uh, methodology. As well as the entire platform, uh, we have um, two series on uh, philosophy and architecture and the guide to the artificial intelligence as well. So this is the fifth lecture uh, for this uh, sequence. And tonight we will have uh, Matt Thompson uh, from uh, CETA uh, give another lecture. So it's a great honor we have the top uh, um, uh, researchers, academic uh, professors in the world come to, uh, uh, to sharing their knowledge and uh, give opportunity to the young PhD candidate to open a new uh, horizon, new, uh, 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 their, their new vision and uh, make their interest uh, to start their research. So firstly, I would like to introduce Mangsat. Mansat um, uh, Z is a designer with a unique academic background and experience in architectural design and competition, computational design and the structural engineering. He is an assistant professor right now of architecture in structures and advanced technologies and a director of a polyhedral structure laboratory. He holds a doctor of science from Institute of Technology and Architecture, ETH. Uh, he holds two degrees from MIT, a Master of Science in Architecture Studies, Computation on Computation, and MARC, the thesis for which uh, he uh, earned him the Renown SOM Award. He also has a degree in earthquake engineering and the dynamic of structures. His main research topic is three-dimensional graphic statics, the structure and architecture design, and the technology. In 2020, he has received a National uh, Science Foundation, NSF uh, Foundation, uh, uh, career, C A R E R, award to extend the methodology of three dimensional polyhedral graphic statics for education, design, and optimization of high performance structures. I think um, uh, Mangsan is a rising star in the academic world because of his reasonable or, or meaningful uh, research. Uh, graphic statics is a very uh, old methodology can tracing back to 300, 400 years ago. And in the contemporary design, because of a competition, make uh, the graphic statics uh, reasonable or meaningful. And uh, I think um, three dimensional graphic statics is right now very, very interesting and uh, which totally open a new horizon in the future formation uh, and uh, which um, relate a lot to the future uh, digital fabrication. So that's why we have a Monson here and I think his research is really meaningful and strongly uh, recommend to the community. So let's welcome Monson to, uh, to share your screen, please. Thank you very much, Philippe. Uh, your voice was um, breaking up uh, when you were giving um, this introduction, but, but thank you very much for the generous introduction and invitation. Uh, I'm very uh, honored to be among the speakers um, in this series. So I'm going to share my screen with you um, and hopefully my voice would not break up uh, during the lecture. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. So we can start. Awesome. So um, um, hello again, everyone. Um, and, uh, again, well, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very glad to be here. I'm very honored um, to be among my mentors and, and uh, really great researchers in this lecture series. I am going to talk about geometry and introduce you to some of the research that um, we have been doing at the University of Pennsylvania since 2017. So uh, let me start with if this works. Okay. Great. So I would like to start uh, my talk um, from a 
renowned puzzle, you can call it, um, uh, which is called uh, Seven Bridges of Konigsberg. So um, in ancient Konigsberg city, there were seven bridges connecting multiple parts of the city that were divided by the river. The puzzle challenged the possibility of finding a path over every one of seven um, uh, bridges without crossing any bridge twice. So Euler, um, who was a mathematician in, in 1736, argued that there is no such path exists. But this plot problem actually laid the foundation of, of graph theory and topology that we use today in the field of mathematics, computer science, structural design, even architecture, right? So um, let's assume that there are only five bridges connecting different parts of the city of uh, Coinsburg. The definition of the topology uh, by the Cambridge Dictionary is as follows. The study of geometric properties and spatial relations unaffected by the continuous changes, change of shape or size of figures. What does that mean? That means that in fact, we can abstract the bridges and their connection to the land ports as a graph, which is illustrated on the right side of your screen, without losing any information that describes the relationship between the land and their connecting bridges. So this is really, really important because um, you can describe a geometric entity uh, just by uh, basically finding the relationship between its components with a simple graph. Right, so in this graph, as you see, um, the A, B, C, D are basically the parts of the city and the bridges are the, are the dark lines connecting them. So something interesting is happening. Suddenly this new graph that you created divided the space into multiple other segments that we can actually la label them by numbers. For instance, here you can label that by three, one, two, and the tree is basically the surrounding space that is connected here. Now, if you start drawing bridges that connect those secondary spaces uh, created by your, uh, by your um, uh, original graph, you ended up describing the topology or, or basically the, the, the river itself. So now you see that why this is really exciting because um, you've found two graphs that are related to each other and if you have one graph, you can basically construct the other graph. And, and the, the members of one graph shows the relationship between the components. That tells you, for instance, how uh, one part of the graph is connected to the other part and what is the meaning of it. And if you, again, if you have one graph, you can immediately construct the other one. Now, go to the... graph and then the rope can divide the space of the paper into three subspaces and then you can name them as subspaces a b and c okay so using the same technique let's try to bridge from one space to the next and create a secondary graph based on original geometry now with just one technique or just like easily, just, just make those bridges being perpendicular to the edges of your original graph. What happens is that suddenly you have the force distribution for your original structure or for your original force or basically tens, tensile network. Why? Because you can basically measure the length of that, uh, that, that edge that is perpendicular to your rope and that describes the magnitude of the force that, that is being exerted at the end of the rope. So besides using topological relationship and, and graph drawing, you can basically find the performance of, for instance, a system using simple geometric diagrams. And this geometric representation of equilibrium in systems was the basis of the methods of graphic statics that many of you have heard of uh, and, and possibly use it uh, in, 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 in design or um, uh, basically uh, analysis of the structures. So there are many, many examples, but why this is important because um, we, we would like to design efficient structural systems, possibly using the same technique. Um, 
if you know if from the from the Fuchs um, concept uh, of hanging chain, the efficient and structural forms carry the force in the form of pure tension or compression in their members. And uh, and basically, this concept was um, uh, picked by many architects, such as Gaudi, and, and used for in order to derive the efficient and structural forms. Uh, so in fact, Gaudi was was designing everything upside down, right? As a as a as an articulated um, hanging chain model, and then building on top of that and detailing on top of this. And why this is this is relevant to the to the methods of graphic aesthetics because the same methodology of drawing the geometry of the force uh, can be used to describe the equilibrium in the funicular forms. In fact, if you have a funicular form, each node in that funicular form can be in equilibrium based on this closed polygon that is topologically and geometrically related to, to the structural form. So in fact, in graphic aesthetics, you have two diagrams that are related to each other, right? And, and uh, basically the edges of one diagram is perpendicular to the other one, and each closed polygon in, in the diagram uh, of the force represents the equilibrium of a node in your structure. And moreover, basically the, the, the in that polygon basically represents the magnitude of the force. But the relation these two diagrams is really, you can change one diagram as And, and many other people who were interested in finding uh, basically efficient structural forms made of um, masonry materials, even uh, concrete, um, like the work by uh, Pierre Eugenervi, Robert Mylart, and, and many more. But what is really important in this uh, process is that for having a new, or let's say there is, an, a, there is a parallel uh, design domain that you can call the, the force domain. And this design domain is basically topologically related to your structural form, and it's based on geometry. It's controlled by the geometry. So why this is important? Because um, basically, in contrast to, to the, the common um, design methodology, you do not start from, a, from an arbitrary form and try to optimize it. You start by designing the force distribution using certain rules, and then you can derive funicular or compressionally or tensionally efficient structural forms as a result of that design. So basically designer in this methodology um, works in a parallel design domain. Well, not literally, well, I would say it can be lit parallel or perpendicular, but this, is, uh, this means that you're not directly working on a form, but rather you're, you're working with the force distribution and geometry of the force equilibrium in your design domain. So I showed you all these examples that were quite uh, basically two-dimensional and very um, intuitive, and it's been used obviously for the past 150 years. The question is that, okay, if a single polygon of force can represent the equilibrium of a node in 2D, what is the equivalent of this um, force distribution and this relationship between the geometry of the force equilibrium and a node in, 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 uh, in two-dimensional work, um, and, and a node basically in, in 3D, right? So um, this um, initiated the research that was related to, to my PhD, and, and I was very lucky to be among uh, the very few who, uh, who worked on this topic and, and developed uh, the method based on this topic. So uh, when I started my PhD, I looked at the history of this proposition and the relationship between the form and the forces, and I realized that uh, uh, historically there was a, um, a mechanical engineer called William um, John Macor and Rankin. And 150 years ago, he proposed the relationship between the equilibrium of forces in three dimension and its geometric representation. So his entire publication is a half a page and I've actually copied and, 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 and put the entire publication here in a philosophical magazine. So it, it consists of only three uh, paragraphs, um, which is very, very intense and difficult to, to understand. Um, I'm not gonna read it for you, but uh, if you have a chance, if you, if you search for it, you will find it and you realize that how difficult 
that paragraph is to understand. That's probably, probably one of the reasons that it did not receive that much attention for the past 150 years. But um, the, the gist of the, uh, the proposition is that if you have a three-dimensional node um, in, uh, in pure compression or pure tension, its force equilibrium can be represented by a closed uh, force polyhedron. Right? Each face of this polyhedron is perpendicular to the applied load. And um, the area of the face represents the matrix of the force. Um, if you compare it with the 2D, where it's the length of the uh, polygon represents the force in 3D, that is translated into the area. And this can be basically proved I'm using this looks to you if you're interested. But uh, one of the important outcome of this is that um, now we have two diagrams in three dimension made of uh, planar faces or polyhedral systems um, that can be used to show the efficient structural forms and their force distribution at the same time, right? So this initiated a move towards a um, three dimensional version of graphic aesthetics that has been used for the past 150 years. And uh, this method is basically called 3D graphic aesthetics using reciprocal polyhedral diagrams, um, because both form and force diagram consists of uh, polyhedral systems. So uh, getting back to the same idea of, of using the force domain as, as your primary uh, design domain, um, this is enough for us to start creating a really exciting uh, spatial funicular um, uh, structural forms. We know that a single polyhedron, closed convex polyhedron can represent a, a spatial node in tension or in pure compression, right? So we can start by aggregating multiple closed polyhedral cells, uh, which has the same base areas. And this aggregation can establish a force distribution. And this force distribution can represent the equilibrium of a spatial network in either pure tension or compression. Right. In that network, the equilibrium of each node is represented by a closed polyhedral cell, and the area of each face basically represents the magnitude of the force in that member um, of, the, of the network. With a little bit of patience and, and design creativity, you can put together a variety of cells to create uh, force distributions um, like this one and extract funicular um, spatial systems that uh, were quite difficult to, um, to basically design if you did not have this method, if you were to start from, from scratch, working in, in a common design domain, uh, trying to optimize your form and basically control the topology. Um, so this is, the, this is the technique that I teach uh, at, at UPenn in my elective course. And the students basically try to put together um, physical models in order to um, uh, physically experience the equilibrium of forces. And, and uh, once they finish the digital model and, and, and just measuring those edge lengths and, and, and basically constructing the geometry based on the edge length of the cable um, enables them to make this, uh, this, this network that is, that's this three-dimensional network that is in pure tension. And the moment that they see that pure tension is happening, they just believe that the, that the system works and, and, and the rules and the, and the principle applies. So one of the interesting aspects of the work is that, or the method I would say, is that it doesn't have um, any limitation in terms of the topology, the, the number of uh, supports, boundary conditions, number of edges, and, and, and you can explore a variety of different um, uh, spatially, I would say spatial particular uh, forms, right? Either compression only, or compression tension as a self-assisted system. So I'm actually going through um, multiple examples of the student works um, to show you the flexibility and the versatility of the, of the tool. But obviously you cannot do this by hand. So you need certain tools uh, to be able to utilize this, um, this principle and this concept in generating a spatial um, a structural systems. So for that reason, we, um, um, Put together a, a, uh, a software for, for or a plugin for Redis is called Polyframe, and, and currently it is in the on the on the beta phase. Um, but 
in, in, in polyframe, basically, you can, you can start with this geometry of the force distribution as an input and, and basically extract the topological uh, dual graph, which is your structural form, and then make the edges of the structural form perpendicular to the corresponding faces of your force distribution and basically get your, um, uh, get your um, funicular structural form. And then you can start playing with uh, various geometric degrees of freedom of, um, of your form without changing the equilibrium state. And uh, obviously with a, with a tool, um, um, the, the tool basically allows you to do so. So you see multiple examples um, um, of, of, uh, of the structures designed here using the same principle, right? So um, in, in the design studios that I'm actually teaching at Penn, this is again a very approach of design. So students starts with a force distribution to explore a variety of the trick possibilities that we can have using, um, using the methods of 3D graphic statics. Obviously, um, as you realize, all these designs are basically are based on the idea that the eventual structural form is going to be either intention uh, or, or uh, compression only. But this is only true if in reality we provide all the boundary conditions and the applied loads used for the design. So, um, uh, so the studio basically um, is based on the idea that we explore the possibilities and, 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 uh, and the range of um, spatial geometries that can be used uh, for design. And obviously, um, the pure optimization is not, um, uh, is not the main emphasis of the work. But, um, but we work with the students to, to, to further um, understand the flow of forces and, and, um, and basically size the numbers and, and understand how, if, if they do not provide the boundary condition, what would happen to the structure and use that technique in order to develop novel um, architectural spaces, right? For programs like airports, airport terminals, uh, even mid-rise buildings. So um, uh, this is another example for instance, of student work that um, we, are, we are working with this in this topological space to design a um, mid-rise structure. And, 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 and the students, again, it starts with this topological distribution of forces to create an indeterminate structure. Um, and, and, and that can be basically used as a, as, a, as a generative tool. Having said that, I'm going to focus mainly on the research that we're doing. And up to this stage, I just wanted to show you that um, um, using the methods, using this topological relationship between the form and force, you can um, explore a variety of different design possibilities. Um, uh, and if you provide the boundary conditions and the design load as you chose um, basically in your uh, design stage, you would get an efficient structural form. I would start with a, um, uh, the first structure uh, built using this technique. Um, this project is called Hydrocrete Prefab Funicular Spatial Concrete. Um, this uh, project uh, was part of the uh, workshop that I taught based on this method right after I finished my PhD uh, in 2016 in Iran. Um, so the structure is quite unique because um, obviously it's a self-supporting structure. The bottom cord of the structure is in pure compression while the top cord is in tension. So the interesting thing is that um, we had to develop particular uh, detailing to transfer the tension force in the concrete members on the top uh, and use the, 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 the cell plate of the top members to keep the bottom cord uh, in compression. So the structure, uh, the bounding box for the structure is actually 10.80 uh, uh, centimeters and uh, 10 by 9.3. Uh, uh, and uh, the, basically the span uh, in the longest, um, the, the largest span inside the structure is 5.40 and, um, and the height of the structure is 2.36. Again, because this was part of the workshop, students developed multiple um, uh, proposals for the structure to be built. And because everything, all the boundary conditions and, and, and the design of the uh, structure solution was controlled geometrically, we could um, very well control the magnitude of the force 
and remove the force from certain boundary conditions that um, we knew there, there wouldn't be any force to support the structure. For instance, we designed the structure as a compressional lead system that could receive the applied loads from above, and then it was supported on the sides and as well as the uh, on the ground. But we knew that on the side of the structure, of this branch construction, we could not have the forces being exerted or applied to the system. So we had to make the magnitude of the forces, uh, which uh, are shown by the areas of the rectangles here, in this case, zero. So we collapsed these re rectangles um, uh, geometrically to a line to make those areas zero. And suddenly we get this um, tension and compression combined system. So as you see, the top courts, uh, members that are, are basically in tension, and the rest of the structure is in compression. Uh, for this reason, we had to develop a particular um, detailing. Right? So we, we could have chosen the top members to be out of uh, cable, but since there wouldn't be any applied load on the structure and we wanted to keep the structure in equilibrium, we used the self members uh, as the applied load for the bottom. Um, uh, particular detailing um, the tensile force. And as you see, um, uh, there are basically tension uh, cables embedded within concrete parts and they're connected to the, to the steel plates and the steel plates transfer the tensile force from one member to the next. Um, but we precisely put um, um, the tensile members within the within the concrete parts so that the, 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 uh, the, the network, the tensile network um, uh, completely matches um, the design of the funicular form. So this is a mock-up of, uh, of the, one of the top uh, members connected to the, to the tension member. And these are some of the scenes um, uh, of prefabrication and assembly of the, uh, of the structure. Um, so one of the most important points that I should mention regarding this structure is that the budget, the total budget for the structure was only $10,000. We could not afford having a really um, complex formwork. We had to use um, a common existing formwork. Uh, we could not make the structure um, asymmetric because um, obviously um, the, the budget issue. So we made it uh, symmetrical and we reused the formwork three times to produce the parts. So this is completed the structure. Um, well, initially, installation was um, supposed to be um, a temporary installation, but after the completion of the project, they locked the project and they decided to keep it um,
would I should have that this project was completely um, a student project. And um, apparently they, did, they overdid the last part a little bit, they uh, overexcited. But I should thank uh, Mehrad Mahria and, 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 um, and the ROM team um, for, for their great contribution to this project. Without them, it was, it was impossible to, to finish the project. Uh, just to give you a couple of um, uh, facts about uh, the material use and performance of the system. So uh, the, the total volume of concrete for this structure was uh, 3.5 cubic meter. And the load bearing capacity was 1,000 kilometers. So if you want to use the same volume of concrete to design a, a conventional porcelain beam structure to span the same span that the structure um, has, um, the load bearing capacity would be uh, decreased by 80 um, to kilonewton. And if you want to increase the load bearing capacity to 1,000 kilonewton, you have to add 330% more concrete and use 10% more rebars. So this clearly shows um, basically the efficiency of the system um, and the inherent elegance, um, which is uh, the result of the uh, use of this method. Right? So the next project I'm going to talk about is called Saltator. Saltator um, um, in Latin means the dancer. And this was an, in an investigation into a composite spatial structure. So we had this experience of building hydrocrete but there, um, the assembly method involved separating the nodes uh, and the edges, and then adding basically incrementally um, the edge and node to complete the structure. Um, in this system, uh, we wanted to see, first of all, how we can make something that can be assembled and disassembled for multiple occasions, uh, how we can actually eliminate the edges and just have the node based assembly. What would be the challenges of the node-based assembly? For instance, we know that the node-based assembly is going to be difficult because we're dealing with, uh, with a spatial system. And uh, what we can use as a uh, base to cover the structure. So we chose a scale that was uh, more manageable um, and it was more uh, appropriate for the facilities we had and, and uh, uh, basically uh, finished the structure. So Salta Tor is Bonsa? Hi, hello. I think, um, yeah, I think maybe he um, quit uh, because of the, the weak uh, internet. Just please wait a moment. I'm, I'm sorry, probably, I don't know. <laughs> yes, uh -huh. there was a disconnection yeah. in the internet. Okay. Yeah. Uh, could you please uh, go back um, from the... Uh, wh where did you miss it? There was a Salta tour, the, the, the project? The... Yeah, I'm talking about the, 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 just the, the first image of the project. Okay. Yeah. Let me start from there. Um, okay. All right. So, um, did you did you hear anything I said about? Uh, yeah, yeah, just uh, finish this this slide and yeah, yes. starting. Yeah. All right. So, salto basically in in, in uh, the Latin means um, well, it's it's actually uh, saltator means a dancer and, and dancing and twisting. That's part of the the word salto. And salto is the same wrestling technique where. Um, 
where you twist basically and, and lift and twist the, the opponent and put it to the ground. And then there is a bridge that is happening um, uh, through basically using this, this technique. So um, we were particularly interested in, in using this idea in the design of the bridge. And I'll uh, get to the point that see how we, we basically applied that twist and turn. Another important um, point in the design uh, of, the, uh, of this structure was that um, how we can actually use different types of force distribution. So far, whatever that I showed um, involved the, um, uh, the equilibrium of a spatial structure that could be described by convex polyhedral cells. But, uh, but in fact, um, the equilibrium system or the force distribution does not have to be convex. It can be self-intersecting or non-convex um, force polyhedrons. Um, and this was something that we investigated in this, in this project, and particularly to control um, the areas of the first faces um, that represents the magnitude of the force in the, uh, in the structure, we developed a quadratic function uh, with a control over the edge length as well. So uh, using this quadratic function, we could uh, specify certain edge length to um, stay intact while changing um, the, the area of the face. So what you're seeing here is very interesting because if you have a convex face, obviously the direction of a normal matches the direction of the applied force in your, in your structure. But when you have a self-intersecting face, uh, the total area uh, of the face is the sum of the weighted area normals. That means that uh, the normal direction of the face would actually flip and if, the, if you sum up those regions with the flip normals, um, uh, you would get, you might actually get positive and negative um, uh, area values. And at certain location, these areas might become equal to each other. That makes the magnitude of the force zero. So why this is important? Because for instance, if you start from the boundary condition of your, of your design, you can control this boundary condition. In this case, it's a trapezoid. To, um, to have a both positive and negative, but equal positive and negative to cancel each other out. And suddenly you can remove these forces from your boundary condition. This is exactly what we, what we implemented in the design of that, that allowed us to create basically the, the top cord that is in tension, remove the horizontal forces. And uh, there is a twist that is happening in the, in the geometry of the structure. Uh, that the triangular on the top is actually 180 degree, uh, uh, has, a, has a 180 degree rotation compared to the triangle in the bottom. So uh, the structure is, is uh, 3.8 uh, centimeter, has a 3.8 centimeter span uh, in one direction and 1.95 centimeter in the other direction. And uh, this is the first um, assembly um, uh, test uh, of the structure without um, uh, the tabletop. Um, so one of the challenges of uh, having node-based assembly is that the sequence of assembly becomes really crucial. And at some point, um, it would not become possible because the members, if you use the conventional male-female connections, uh, you cannot insert the nodes into your system and you cannot complete it. So we have to develop a particular detailing um, uh, that is called uh, lock, um, rotatory lock mechanism that could be embedded within the, within the formwork of the structure. Um, and then uh, this basically um, uh, facilitates the, the, um, uh, the, the assembly process. As soon as you have two nodes available, two edges of the nodes available, you can continue the assembly with no um, uh, particular uh, sequence. So we also incorporated um, these metal um, basically anchor points to, to make sure that if uh, during the assembly of the project uh, structure experience tensile load, it can basically transfer effect with tensile force and the bending force between the members. Um, so um, this is the, the completed assembly of the structure, right, as you can see. But now the difficulty was to, okay, how we can actually design a, a um, load bearing system that can cover this, um, this piece of furniture or, or a table. So um, uh, we assumed that, okay, so let's just design a, um, a glass structure to stand 
uh, four meters or almost 3.80 um, uh, centimeters. So the difficulty uh, uh, for, for designing a, a glass piece that can be supported in only three locations and, 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 and can sit based on self-weight on top of the table was that um, if, if we wanted to use glass, uh, the glass should not basically bend under the self-weight. And, um, and if, if, you, if you don't want the, the glass not to bend under self-weight, you have to use 2.5 centimeter thick um, tempered glass, which uh, adds up the, the self-weight of the, of, of the glass itself to 500 kilograms. So this is gonna make it really, really difficult and impossible for a piece to be installed and also uh, basically relocated. So we looked at uh, the lily flower, and, um, and we were inspired by the, by the structural uh, design of the flower and designed a similar compression only system that can uh, take the forces. But again, due to the complexity of construction and, and uh, the lack of facility to, to, um, to cast glass, um, uh, we, we dropped this idea and just simplified the entire thing into a tree hinged arch. Uh, and, and, and basically designed it uh, as, uh, as a very, very thin glass that can span uh, this, um, uh, this distance and sit on the, on the corners of the structure. So we used, uh, uh, we collaborated with, uh, with an artist uh, who had a huge kiln, so we, we could actually slump form the glass um, uh, in, in her kiln. And uh, using this technique, we were able to use only four millimeter glass. So this is one of the pieces uh, that I'm holding together. This is the first piece I tested. And um, uh, obviously the bottom part, um, uh, you see some artifacts, which is not ideal. So we had to redo that. But, uh, but it, it, it showed us that if, if you want to expand that distance, and if you want the structure to basically self-support itself uh, and accept additional loads, um, we had to form it into the particular form. Although the glass is uh, only um, uh, four millimeter, but uh, we were able to do that. And we also use the particular detailing that can be attached to glass uh, using a, um, uh, a very special um, uh, um, tape or uh, you can say adhesive that is called the transparent structural silicon. And uh, we were able to just for a couple of minutes basically assemble this uh, together. But uh, the structural silicon that the, the, the transparent structural silicon was really difficult to be applied because uh, we did not have um, uh, a, a um, uh, autoclave. So, um, uh, so we could not have this piece basically permanently on the table, but uh, it was enough to take a couple of pictures. So uh, we were lucky because the piece was actually selected for the virtual exhibition of Venice Biennale uh, this year. So I'm going to let you watch the movie. Oh, uh, I'm sorry, I forgot to, just a second, sorry. Forgot to enable the music. To reshare that. The salt art door demonstrates innovative research in the design and fabrication of a prefab structure. The structural form of the project was developed using a three-dimensional, geometry-based, structural design method known as 3D graphic statics. This enables precise control over the magnitude of the lateral forces in the system. The entire volume of concrete used for this structure is 0.06 cubic meters distributed and 4.44 cubic meters of space. This volume makes the relative density of this structure as small as 1%, equivalent to the relative density of the human bone. The structure is capable of carrying 700 kilograms. Funicular geometry using a slumped form technique to carry the self-weight, as well as the applied loads on the surface, was used to develop the ultra-thin 4 mm glass structure that spans 3.75 meters. The salt artor consists of 56 concrete nodes joined together with steel lock plate mechanisms. The entire concrete body of the structure is held in compression by the tension ties at the top and bottom of the structure. 
An innovative detailing was developed that allows locking each member in its exact location in the body, obviating the need for a particular assembly sequence. Although the concrete structure has been designed to act in pure compression, some of the members will experience tensile stress in the cases of asymmetric loads. The proposed steel connection transfers the tensile forces between the concrete members effectively. The spatial concrete nodes were fabricated by injecting high-strength concrete in 3D printed molds. This holds the bespoke steel connections in their precise location at the ends of the members of each node. The salt art ore impeccably combines efficiency, elegance, and economy in one product, whose fabrication technique opens a new horizon for the future of construction of large-scale systems. All right. So, um, another project that is basically a work in progress, and um, I would like to share some updates with you. Um, again, it's based on the same, same methodology, but, but taking advantage of uh, one of the inherent um, characteristics of the polyhedral diagrams. So um, probably you're, you're very familiar with the, uh, um, with the process of design and construction of uh, glass, um, glass domes or glass shell structures. Well, uh, and usually the form finding and optimization is, um, uh, is happening separately from each other. So you have to find the form and then you basically optimize it. And then uh, and you need to maybe use either planar pieces of glass or triangular pieces of glass to make that uh, happening. What happens is that in, in the methods of 3D graphic aesthetics, um, for instance, you can have um, the structural system or as, as, as a compression only form. Uh, and, and the interesting property of, of the uh, of the polyhedral system is that yes, it may it is made out of uh, planar sheets, and you have these planarity constraints embedded in the in the methodology. So, for instance, here I'm using a single node and the equilibrium of it that can be described by a single tetrahedron, and then I'm starting to subdivide this um, this force distribution to suddenly change that node topologically to a compression only shell that I have control over the force distribution and I can control the height of the shell, et cetera, et cetera. But the most important thing is that uh, all the faces of the shell are already planar. So I basically using the same technique, I could combine optimization, well, the form finding, if you will, and the, the, uh, and the fabrication into a single uh, process. So inspired by this uh, property, we designed a, um, pedestrian glass bridge that is made of um, So the bridge is actually made of uh, planar pieces of glass. Um, originally one centimeter, that was the intention for the glass, but obviously for security reasons and um, uh, factor of safety, we have to increase that. The, um, the idea is that the entire um, structure of the glass has been designed as a, a spatial uh, funicular network. And so it's a double layer network uh, and you can call it basically a sandwich uh, um, uh, system. Um, but the, the, the most important thing compared to the, to the common um, masonry system is that uh, we are using um, hollow glass blocks in order to uh, complete the project. So 
Um, there are certain objectives for the project. Um, obviously, we are trying to minimize the use of material and, and uh, we would like to uh, consider the modular construction for the assembly. Um, we have to reinvent the structural detailing of the glass connection. And if we can do this with the, if you, if you can basically show this structure made out of glass, thin sheets of, of glass, uh, which is one of the most challenging um, construction materials, we can certainly uh, extend the method to, uh, to uh, any other sheet-based construction material like aluminum, steel, et cetera. So um, we did a pre preliminary uh, analysis, um, just a feasibility analysis to see whether um, for the same form consists of thin uh, glass plates, the structure can hold its self-weight and also uh, four kilonewton per square meter um, live load on the, uh, on the on the uh, deck of the bridge, and the feasibility is, uh, study was quite positive. So um, we move forward um, with the construction technique. Uh, we decided to use basically hollow glass block um, uh, to to uh, construct the um, the bridge. And um, obviously, we cannot make uh, the the glass block easily, but we decided to use the uh, uh, the inexpensive methods of construction for this purpose. So um, uh, each glass block consists of two deck plates and the side plates that, uh, that are connecting those deck plates. And, um, and basically we are using five axis uh, water jetting capabilities to um, uh, precisely cut the corners so that uh, we get the geometry really well integrated uh, into a hollow glass block. Um, Currently, the, the pieces are held together by a product called uh, a VHP tape. It's two millimeter and one millimeter VHP tape. Um, it's a very, again, inexpensive um, uh, adhesive that is used for um, currently actually for, 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 for the construction of glass facades in the United States. And, uh, and, and, and uh, we put a prototype together just to understand the mechanical performance of this. Obviously we had to come up with some uh, jigs and mechanisms to, um, to basically assemble the pieces together and then add the deck plates to, uh, uh, to the side plates in order to complete the part. And uh, uh, we took this um, example, which is asymmetric and did the load, load testing to understand how much force we can exert to this uh, building block uh, and how would it behave and then basically validate our, our analytical results for into that to see whether this is a good building block or not, right? So uh, this is the load testing scene. The number that you see that uh, on the corner is actually in kips. Um, so it could take um, up to 37,000 uh, pounds, which is, Equivalent to 24 um, yeah, to 20, 24 um, tons of load. So, um, so the, the interesting thing about the uh, the project is that um, we are using the float glass. This is just a regular window glass held together with that double sided VHP tape, which is very inexpensive. And and uh, with this system, um, we are able to uh, get a really good performance. So um, we are currently working on uh, basically extending this method and, and uh, use it for the actual assembly of the, of the largest scale bridge. But one of the challenges in, in, uh, in designing a uh, glass only uh, bridge is to develop particular detailing um, for, the, for the blocks to engage with each other and transfer the shear as well as the vertical um, load on the sides. Uh, this is a work in progress, so I won't be able to show uh, more than uh, these little images, but um, uh, we are using, again, we are casting glass into a particular geometry as a side plate, so that can interlock with each other. So uh, we can eliminate the use of um, any other um, uh, basically fasteners or, or metal um, to connect the pieces together. Uh, the other project that I wanted to show you uh, was inspired. It's a, it's a simple, uh, not simple, but, but basically a, a um, interesting design research we did um, to incorporate the method that we have with, uh, with machine learning and uh, generate a variety of different uh, uh, results. The, the, um, the research was inspired by the Mason Dominion Hawks, um, by um, 
Le Corbusier. And then obviously we were inspired by, uh, by the very famous examples, uh, such as, for instance, um, Palazzo del Lavaro by uh, Pierluigi Kirby, which was thing, floor designed by, by um, Black Research Group and Zoology Lecture Hall at the University of Freiburg, and also BFAP House by Donald Sokolov Research and DDT ETH. So the idea is that, okay, so um, we are designing, uh, this is basically a post and beam system, um, uh, but we can have a this distribution of the force and, and, uh, and, a, uh, and the method to, to eliminate or reduce the amount of concrete used for uh, such um, uh, concrete constructions. And in 2D, obviously the force diagram can be represented by, um, uh, by this diagram on the right. And we can extend the method to three dimension and develop a force distribution in three dimension that uh, can transfer the applied those to the columns underneath. But obviously we have infinite possibilities to design, um, to design this force distribution. And the idea was to uh, basically explore some of those and, and uh, combine it with machine learning to be able to um, see how powerful the design tool can be. So these are some of the uh, examples uh, that I'm going to show you. So you can see that by basically applying the method, you can reduce obviously the amount of concrete used for it. So while the, um, the elegance is obviously the, um, uh, the immediate result of this, um, uh, of this method. But uh, you can see up to 32, 46, and 47, even 67% of, uh, of concrete you can reduce using this technique. And you can incorporate not only the, the columns, but you can use the start playing with adding walls to, to the plant, et cetera. So um, yeah, so these are some of the examples. You can see, for instance, 51.7% reduction, 52%, 32, 31. And you have a variety of different options. Um, and you're not really the limited in terms of um, the design possibilities. So how does this work? We basically, as a design, um, as a designer, you can start with a sketch, and then we interpret that sketch using machine learning technique. The machine learning um, basically translate that into the force distribution. Force distribution translated uh, into the to the subdivision, and the subdivision technique eventually shows itself um, as a, uh, a basically floor system that transfers the forces and finds the load pass um, to, to the walls or uh, the columns that are originally um, input by, um, uh, by the designer as just a simple sketch. Uh, um, another project I wanted to share with you is the um, from polyhedral um, to anticlastic funicular spatial structures. In 2017, one of the earlier studies that we did was to basically took um, we, we, um, we took a uh, very simple uh, structure made out of um, 12 kilograms of concrete, but again, we designed the same uh, compression only system and we, we subjected this structure to the, to the compressive force. And this 12 kilogram system showed a, a really interesting behavior. So it could take up to 250 kilonewton of force. So um, obviously with what we were shocked with was the, um, the local buckling that happened in the system. And uh, we were not really expecting that the system could take that much force. But um, well, first of all, what you realize is that the local buckling does not necessarily result in global failure. And if, when the system can actually redistribute the force due to its uh, geometric indeterminacy. And then once it's failed, all the parts basically reached to their a limit um, um, to the stress limit, and the entire structure exploded at once, meaning that um, we could utilize uh, the material um, uh, really, really well. And we used uh, this basically shows the efficiency of the system. So if you want to, if you want to have a uh, basically gauge the the structure that was only twelve kilograms or twenty five pounds, we're able to take um, that's twelve thousand as uh, pounds. Uh, it's not actually great, it's actually 54,000, but uh, yeah. So um, it, was a, it was a very interesting um, experience. And again, similar to the, um, to the subdivisions that I showed you, there are uh, plenty of options that you can actually play with and generate a variety of different uh, structural forms um, that could 
uh, be designed for the same boundary condition. The problem with all these designs was that uh, we were mainly dealing with buckling in the, in the structure. And obviously the fabrication of the project is not easy because we are dealing with three-dimensional nodes and uh, it has to either be 3D printed or any other method needs to be developed, which is not really, really easy. So uh, one of my PhD students basically took this uh, um, research further to see how we can develop techniques to um, basically while keeping the force flow and without changing the equilibrium of forces, we translate this N-manifold or three completely three-dimensional uh, structure to a two-manifold system. So uh, he developed a technique um, uh, that he could remove certain faces based on a, a particular geometric and topological relationship between the cells within the polyhedral system so that the, that the remaining part of the structure would be only two manifold or a single surface that is dividing uh, only two spaces with respect to each other. So what is the, um, the outcome? The outcome is that you, you get the, um, basically a spatial network that is compressional and retention only. And with a particular division, subdivision or a technique of subdivision, you're able to translate that to a, almost a shell-based um, a structure in three dimensions. So this is actually the terminology of, of mechanical engineering called a cellular system. So it's a spatial shell. So why this is important? Because suddenly uh, you uh, go from a structural system that, that, uh, that was relying on buckling performance to a shell performance. And you could perform, you could basically improve the load bearing capacity by up to three times. So, uh, this is this is another conceptual design based on that, but you can see not only you can minimize it, you can we can basically optimize the fabrication of that. You can you can simplify the fabrication of this because you can make it out of uh, single sheet and flat sheet material, and it's a two manifold only, so you don't have to uh, be worried about the uh, the three dimensional modes. Uh, he's using right now the the same uh, technique into developing. Um, uh, basically triply periodic um, uh, structural system applicable to, to the material science and is investigating um, those um, uh, together with another collaborator from McGill University. Uh, another project that I would like to show you is the investigation into um, the, the design domain, the, the, the basically the form domain. So, so far, I, I, I talked about a case where we can design and we can play with the force distribution, we can design the force and we can get a variety of different forms. But uh, one thing that is really important to know is that a single force distribution can represent the equilibrium of multiple different configuration of forces in 3D. So for instance, you can basically take a compression only node and then take one of the edges and push it in the same direction uh, to go in the other side of the node and suddenly the number would be in tension. Without changing the force distribution, you describe the equilibrium in the system that is combined tension and compression. So what does that mean? That means that for instance, if this force distribution could show the equilibrium of, or could represent the equilibrium of a compression only system, now uh, with particular manipulations, you can basically force certain edges of the form to go into tension without changing the force and doing it for the opposite side. So you get a variety of different equilibrium solution, again, for the same design of the force, right? I'm just showing some of the animations here. This definitely increases uh, your design palette, right? So you can, you can go from either compression to completely tension only or compression and tension combined. And you go from a synclastic to anticlastic in any direction, right? That, that obviously the topology allows you to do. So um, what does that mean? That means that yes, the network such as this network can be turned into this solution, that solution, or any other solution. And this is called basically playing with the geometric degrees of freedom of the, of the form diagram. And uh, obviously, um, uh, opens up the door to, uh, to explore a variety of different forms that is just beyond compression on the attention on the systems. Um, let's get back to nature 
and, and some structures. We, we briefly mentioned that the efficient structural forms carry the force internally in the form of pure tension or pure compression. So this is basically true. Obviously, if you take a section through the bone, the structure of the bone shows that the material has been distributed where the principal um, stress uh, values are existing and basically trying to minimize the use of material and, and optimize or maximize the structural performance. You can see this performance in many different um, uh, basically creatures and, and, and phenomena. So one of the interesting um, aspects is that we, we were also inspired by um, the, the structure of a dragonfly wing, which is one of the uh, most efficient structures um, uh, that, that nature has created after millions of millions of years of evolution. So why did we choose this? Because um, the, the network of the dragonfly wing is very similar to the tension only or compression only. It's mainly consists of, it mainly consists of um, uh, convex cells. And the same idea of the topological relationship between the spaces created by this network um, uh, exists. So we wanted to take this idea and, and really analyze it and to see what we can understand from this network. So the first thing that, uh, that we did, and, and this is, by the way, one of the work of my PhD students, Hao Zheng. And um, what he did, basically, he took the internal network of the dragonfly wing, and he extracted the force distribution based on this original network. So what you see on the right uh, is basically the force distribution based on the methods of 2D graphic aesthetics and, and uh, the network of the dragonfly wing. And then what he did, he basically regenerated the form uh, based on the boundary conditions um, and compared the, um, the thickness of the members and the regenerated form based on the force that he got from the actual wing and the actual thickness of the members in the wing. The interesting thing is that they are very well um, basically uh, matching with each other. So there is a, there's a really good match. And this basically shows that Yes, the same principle works in nature, more or less. And um, these are basically some of the, the, the existing wings and the, the regenerated one is actually shown by, by, um, by blue. And, and uh, uh, there's a really, really good, um, uh, basically, um, correlation between these, between these um, um, uh, the structures. So now this opens up a really interesting question that is that, okay, how we can extend this um, understanding to the boundary condition and what we can learn from that, as well as, uh, okay, what is the tension surface that keeps the wing in, 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 um, in equilibrium, in this network in equilibrium. And, and he's basically currently exploring that and seeing how he can extend this um, further to use it uh, for applications that would be relevant to, um, to architecture uh, and, and engineering. So I'm going to conclude with uh, just an example of um, our work in progress. Again, a web-based tool that is supported by uh, National Science Foundation. So we are currently also developing a, an interactive platform for 3D graphic aesthetics for education and, uh, and designs and obviously sharing the knowledge with, um, uh, with, uh, with the students and practitioners. This is really important because um, uh, right now, you uh, you may need a Rhino plugin uh, or certain knowledge of, of three dimensional modeling to work and understand this um, this um, this method. But the um, the main objective behind developing such such platforms um, is that to make it more accessible for um, for everyone. Um, and I would be able to share actually more with you soon, hopefully. Okay. So uh, with that slide, I'm actually coming to the end of uh, my presentation and uh, I would be happy to take any questions or um, any discussions that we might have. Great, well said. Thanks a lot for the great lecture, very interesting. So um, could you please um, click to the sh sharing the screen and then we can see each other. Okay, great. Thanks a lot for the fantastic Thank you. lecture. <laughs> Thank you. It's very Thank you. fundamental 
but actually it's really difficult <laughs> to answer. <laughs> yeah, the, the form diagram, form diagram, and force diagram, which is a very important, very important um, um, presentation and the transformation to understand uh, the forces flow uh, in architecture. Especially your contribution is to set up a special toolbox uh, to transfer the three-dimensional forces. And you can see from the cube of the force diagram to present a joint um, and in a very complicated uh, structure. Um, and um, the first question goes to uh, most of your research actually goes to this kind of joint-based um, polyhedral uh, geometry system. So um, I, I want to question, is there any uh, special uh, possibility or it's all this kind of three-dimensional uh, um, gravistatics formation will leading us goes to a certain kind of uh, formalism, formalism because it's kind of style, which is polyhedral based to make connection of this compression only bar uh, structures uh, in the future uh, spatial system. Is, it, is that a certain kind of uh, style based on this toolbox? So uh, could you please answer uh, the limitation of the three-dimensional uh, uh, gravistatics formation uh, a relationship between this methodology to the to the formation and geometry results of course, system. Of, course. of course yes um, of course so um, yes you're right so um, uh, this, basically when you're dealing with polyhedral system or if you're using this particular method um, you already accept that uh, the method has certain limitations. And what are those limitations? The limitation, the main limitations that you're dealing with um, polyhedral system with planar faces, right? So uh, the immediate thing that comes to mind is that, okay, um, if I want to literally translate these polyhedral systems to a working structure, I need to dig either the edges and the nodes and basically translate that into the structure. As, as you said, you ended up with, um, with these, uh, with these spatial networks, right? That you might actually call it this type, right? But there's also another uh, way to approach that, right? You don't have to always take directly the, um, the results that you're getting from the polyhedral system and translate it. What you can do is that you can make sure that the geometry that you're designing for your structure can embed this network within itself. So that geometry might not be necessarily polyhedron, might actually have double curvature surface or whatever, as long as you can basically um, embed those um, basic networks within the section of your structure, you can make sure that the system is efficient or follows the force flow, et cetera. So you can add to the, to the, to the architectural detail. The other thing is that what you actually pointed out really well, and this is one of the reasons that we, we try to move away from, uh, from the node-based assemblies, right? So the, the, the project like, like Glassbridge is, is particularly taking advantage of the planar faces and, and eliminating any node that might be related to the system, right? So this, mm -hmm. uh, this project particularly works with planar uh, sheets of polyhedron. Again, you have this polyhedral system, yes, that's true, but then um, uh, the difference is that you are approximating curvature using these, these faces, right? So you don't have any node, but you still see that. Um, the other project that might be um, uh, worth visiting is the same project that I was explaining all the way at the end, which is related to the cellular system, right? The cellular system are, again, the discretized approximation of polyhedral, but it's, it's getting to the double curvature um, and, 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 and the spatial, basically, shells. Um, that again, does not have to uh, literally made out of polyhedral cells, but as long as you can embed that uh, basically uh, truss network or that polyhedral force distribution within the section of your shell, you can, you can uh, argue that your structure is, um, is, uh, is basically efficient. But one yeah. thing that, 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 uh, that is um, worth visiting and uh, we keep seeing that coming back is that um, you see these polyhedral systems everywhere, particularly in nature, right? So if you look at the, 
the cross section of, um, for instance, I, I showed an example of the dragonfly. Root. But if you look at the, for instance, the, the, the formation of the cells, if you look at the, the microscopic the structural systems, they are they are mainly made out of polyhedral uh, networks. Where, so it's really difficult actually to find a triangulated um, network within the nature. The nature tries to use polyhedral system all the time. Um, the question, I don't know the answer, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, the short answer to your question would be yes, you might be limited to certain limitations of the polyhedral system, but you don't have to accept it literally, whereas you can basically have your own interpretation and try to embed the system within uh, your design. Yeah, great. I think uh, you're pointing out uh, uh, it's really uh, interesting in the butterfly wing project and also the glass um, bridge project and also the, the, the last one, which is about the uh, double curvature concrete printing uh, bridge. So that's all uh, quite different to this kind of uh, polyhedron uh, system, but actually still based on the methodology. That part is really deep. I'm trying to reading out the uh, initial uh, logic of your research, but I still need time um, to understand. That's why I think it's quite advanced uh, to make a further research for a long time because uh, that's that's quite interesting because in the nature, so many good phenomena, but uh, um, human being difficult to analyze uh, the intelligence in the nature. So that's why uh, this year um, uh, the topic of our uh, publication is material performance, uh, material intelligence, and also your student Zheng Hao um, and contribute his research. I think uh, uh, I read it. It's, it's quite interesting of in your in your group. I think uh, to just find a very fundamental uh, uh, perspective of methodology. Uh, what's the name of your plugin? for uh, Rhino? Uh, it's developed. called Polyframe. Yes, it's a Polyframe. We are actually moving the Polyframe to, to Grasshopper soon. So um, this is going to change and it's going to have uh, many capabilities, including okay. some of the things that I just yeah. showed, yes. Please um, make more introduction on this platform because my PhD students, they're quite interested in this platform and introduced to me several okay. times. Uh, but I think it's it's very strong uh, skills uh, um, uh, based on this platform. So we're we are curious on um, how would you like um, uh, to set up this uh, toolbox and what's your future plan and what's the could you have a brief introduction of the the polyframe adding something uh, to us on this? Of course, you want me to explain it right now. Um, yeah. The polyframe? Maybe, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, of course. So um, right now, um, uh, one of the I would say limitations of the software is that, uh, well, let, let's not call it a limitation because the entire <laughs> thing that I was actually discussing was that um, you start um, with a design domain that is unconventional. You basically design the geometry of the course. You don't start with the with the actual form, and and this is what you basically get from right. So uh, in a polyframe is the same. So you basically design, you put together certain faces that is made out of either uh, poly surfaces or mesh. So uh, it's going to be extended to mesh soon. Um, but, but let's just say you have poly surfaces that these guys can make a closed polygon, polyhedron. So you don't have to yourself find those closed polyhedrons and put it there. You just need to start with certain faces that they meet each other and then they can together construct a polyhedron. What the software does is that it, it basically selects all your faces and basically finds all possible polyhedral cells that can be made with the, with the input you provide to the software. So then mm -hmm. what it does is that again, similar to the, to the bridge project, the, the bridge example of the topology of the Koenigsberg, it basically finds the dual system and then tries to make the edges of the dual perpendicular to the faces of, of the primal. And then uh, the interpolate, basically the, the, the adjustments and the modification can actually have to, uh, happen directly on the form. We can work with that. So um, it's, it's pretty simple, I would say. But the reason that it looks complex is that because um, you need to relate in your brain 
the polyhedron to the actual form. And then the question is that, okay, we usually tend to think in the, the other design domain. We, we would always think about, okay, how can I make such form? And then you try to basically reverse engineer it to, to do that in the four stuff. <laughs> so this is, this is the tricky part. But, um, but for that reason, we're developing this uh, platform, this online platform with a series of, uh, we, with a library that includes series of investigations showing that how you can create multiple polyhedral forms that are in pure tension or pure compression, but, but you need particular subdivision skill or subdivision method basically to get there. And having that library is really key because then you can actually use that for your design and use it for, uh, to develop a variety of different um, spatial structure forms. That, that is the, the, the most difficult part that, uh, that I hope that in the new development, we can actually address it and make it, uh, make it more understandable for everyone who wants to use it. Yeah, I think uh, uh, that's an interesting part for uh, collaborative research. Uh, sometimes it's, uh, not, it's not means we need to face-to-face -face, uh, collaborate with each other, but uh, some platform you produce will give opportunity for the other people to share knowledge with you. And uh, we need time to understand your logic. And, and it, we just find it's very easy for the uh, transformation to understand the three-dimensional forces, how to make descri description from your translation from your tools. And, and we try to gener generate the form followed by this kind of logic. So that's um, a very uh, interesting uh, or precise and deep research in the PhD level or uh, in the very high standard researchers right now in architecture and uh, in architecture discipline, which is quite cross discipline to, to the structure uh, engineer and st structure science. Um, I think uh, that is the most attractive part. But at the same time, I think um, uh, perspective are quite, quite different. Architects normally thinking in a more formal ways uh, the geometry sometimes did not uh, present only geometry. Sometimes it present some other uh, uh, other performance. Uh, so uh, and also at the same time we find um, when we design a bridge, my team design a bridge every year, and I, I, I find you're doing the similar work. Uh, but it's quite interesting. We have some different because sometimes the bridge is not only compre compression only uh, structure. We need to take in account different kind of condition boundary, uh, boundary conditions, and um, uh, especially uh, for the wind force and the earthquake forces that will give um, some other shear forces uh, to the, especially the joints, right? So uh, I think the working flow is much more complicated than uh, one toolbox can generate the whole architecture. It, it, it will which will help us to generate the form and concept. So I want to ask you, uh, when you're making a certain kind of prevalent research or the bridge research, uh, how would you like to address your uh, uh, methodology to the whole uh, uh, scenario? Because it's more complicated to face with different problems. Very, very, <laughs> uh, very to the point uh, question, uh, Philippe. I really appreciate it. This is, so, Yes, what you said is correct. So um, the fact is that, let me, let me tell you some of the limitations of using graphical methods. So one of the main limitations of using graphical methods is that you design for, let's just set aside all the complexities of a polyhedral system. Let's just assume that you completely understand the polyhedral system and you can basically use it for design. And one of the main limitations is that you are designing and you're finding your efficient structural form for a very particular design case. Right, uh, but as you know, you're dealing with the structures in nature that the, the forces are difficult to be predicted many times, as I said. So unpredicted forces like asymmetric loading, like uh, basically uh, wind load, earthquake load, and, and so many other forces might be actually applied to the system. So how can we make sure that what we are designing can withstand those applied system? So, um, for that reason, the way that we, we work with the, with the method is that the method is used for the initial form finding a stage. Once we find the initial form, 
for a particular design that we consider as the, as the dominant design. Load. Let's just say the dominant design load is the applied load by the pedestrian or the cell fate of the bridge, or maybe it's a wind load, whatever. That is your dominant design load. But this does not necessarily automatically translate um, uh, into final structural form. Similar to glass bridge. For instance, we got the form of the glass bridge. Yeah, and they said that, okay, if you, if you made it out of glass as a, as a preliminary thing, it's going to work. The problem is that the bridge, as you said in yourself, is going to have dynamic loads, it's going to have asymmetric load, it's going to have shear forces, et cetera, et cetera. And we need to do lots of other analysis and develop design decision after getting the form to make sure that your structure basically is capable of, of carrying all these un, 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 unpredicted uh, loadings. So uh, I, we, currently we are working on a, on a research that I did not include because this is uh, again a work in progress, but it's actually related to 3D printing concrete, right? So in that project, we are not, we were particularly interested in, uh, in, in designing a structure that is not compression. -able. So it, it has to take compression attention to that. So one of the difficulties of working with, uh, with concrete, uh, concrete and particularly the, 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 the compression only and this node-based assembly is the shear force, as you said it yourself. So the question is that how you're going to transfer the shear force among the members? What do you need to do in addition to your form finding? What type of design or materialization needs to happen in addition to the form finding to make this feasible? So for this reason, we are basically combining it with another methods of design, which is related to uh, volumetric modeling and, and, and distance functions, et cetera, et cetera. So we can really reinforce it from many other aspects. That is not just about form finding. It's about how you detail it for architectural and other purposes or other loading cases that uh, the structure might experience. But uh, again, the short answer to your question would be, um, I'm not trying to um, just provide a um, one size fit for all, uh, basically approach in the architectural design, because as you said yourself, it, would, it might actually end up being just the style and it would lose its, um, its importance or, or basically uh, it effect in, uh, in designing systems. So, Obviously, there is not a single solution that I can provide for anything. And this method cannot be applied to everything. There are so many limitations with this method that needs to be taken into consideration. And, and this is what I know exactly. And I know that, for instance, the methods of 3D graphic statics using polygonal system has its own limitation. Planarity thing, the planarity constraint is one of the limitations. But the question is that within that limitation, how much you can explore, right? What, what you can do. Uh, what you can achieve, what, what, what structures you can still design to stay within that constraint region, right? <laughs> Sorry, yeah, that yeah. was a really long question. Very good uh, feedback. Uh, another question uh, goes to, because you mentioned uh, you implement uh, 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 the machine learning actually in the, uh, the slab uh, optimization uh, research. I think that's extremely interesting because most of the artificial intelligence right now is um, two-dimensional image um, base uh, of uh, data uh, uh, training or uh, learning uh, process to generate different kind of uh, two-dimensional form. But actually, in your research, is a great um, uh, 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 presentation to showing uh, to find a different kind of uh, optimum um, percentage to generate uh, the slab and column uh, uh, beam system. That's, that's quite interesting to me. Uh, but I, I, I want to ask more detailly on um, how uh, uh, to implement uh, the machine learning as, as a tool uh, to generate a, a different three-dimensional form. So this, this research is actually a continuation of the research that Howe did on the uh, development of a shell. So he basically looked at the compression only systems and uh, I can refer you to the actual paper that he wrote on the, on the um, automation and construction. But what he did over there was to, um, to basically understand the relationship again between form and force, right? So there 
the, as you said, the two-dimensional, um, so that was actually a vector-based machine learning system. So what he was com com uh, comparing was, he was generating variety of different um, solutions, right, the structural solutions, and he was basically uh, assessing the structural performance and looking at, and, and in the meantime, he was comparing the, um, uh, the design of the force diagram, the geometry of the force diagram, and see, for instance, what element, what subdivision, what technique he used there that resulted in a better structural performance. So um, it, was not, it, was, it was not based on image processing. It was basically merely based on the results he was getting as a result of operations, right? So uh, he used the same technique for that one. That's why, yeah. I think that's a very interesting part because um, machine learning is very two-dimensional, as we know. But I think uh, the form diagram and the force diagram is a special methodology to translate uh, the two-dimensional thinking or diagrams, this kind of translation from two-dimension to three-dimension. So uh, because your methodology actually is 3D um, uh, graphic static. So I think probably it's a special window you open uh, to uh, implement, to deploy the, um, uh, the machine learning methodology from two dimension to three dimension. But that's not just based on the machine learning methodology, but because of the force diagram and force diagram and, force, uh, and the form diagram is kind of a translation from this phenomenon, this scenario to that scenario. So that, that is a very interesting part um, of the research. And uh, how uh, Zheng Hao uh, actually presented um, in, in some young um, um, researchers platform, but uh, still uh, uh, we're interested in the, in the process, in the process and how <laughs> address how this kind of... yes. Yes, yes. Yeah, no, great question. I, uh, I need to, maybe we can actually get together another time together with Hao so he can actually also explore, explain more details about his work. Um, mm -hmm. But the idea about his PhD basically is that he can um, he can relate uh, he can understand. So here is the thing. So let's uh, simply put in, in 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 the application of machine learning and design, you basically if if the general approach is is, is used is that you basically deal with with um, uh, with image and you process one image and you basically extract and you construct something else. Uh, what um, in the form and force diagram, as you said yourself, now suddenly you don't have one image. You have another image that has a relationship with the initial image. So there are two spaces now suddenly available, not just one space. So this can be explored. That's exactly what he's doing, for instance, in the, in the project of Dragonfly wing that, um, that uh, can be explored further than how he can generate uh, things based on machine learning. But, but, the, but the example that was related to, um, to the floor and the, and, the, and the thickness of concrete, this was mainly based on assessing the performance and relating that performance to the topology of the force and using that as, as basically. So there was no image processing involved in the first one, um, uh, which is again, an interesting approach. Good. But we can obviously go into detail. Uh, <laughs> <you gotta. laughs> I still need time to learn your, your, your very special uh, methodology. Here, uh, we want to give question to the floor. And, sure. and Mohammed um, uh, Boinjoy have a question. Uh, can you see it? Yes, yes. So, uh, this is interesting. And thank you. I would like to ask more explanation and correspondence between 2D force networks and, and polyhedron stress function. For example, area stress function. Okay, they're really technical questions. Good question, Mohammed. What I would actually suggest you to look, uh, it's difficult to basically explain it with hands here without having any presentation. Yes, there is a relationship between 3D graphic aesthetics and, and area stress function. Even there is a relationship between area stress function and 3D graphic aesthetics. I would encourage you to take a look at the works by Alan Microbi and Chris Williams and William F. Baker. So uh, particularly they would have a, a, a good paper in uh, ISS this, uh, this year, uh, 2021, sorry. So if you're interested in that aspect, please um, uh, attend that session and, and find their, their paper. This is the best source. Good. <laughs> so um, Neil, do you have any question you want to put forward? 
I hear. Well, well uh, no, I, <laughs> I, I can't say <laughs> what, what thing Mohammed is, is, is um, uh, Masoud is. I mean, first of all, Afarin, fantastic presentation. Uh, one thing I've discovered with engineers is that the smarter they are, the 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 simpler they made it seem. I mean, deceptively so. I, I found that uh, Panagiotis Michalatos is kind of like that. Chris Williams certainly like that. And I think you are a bit like that. You know, you, and I think that's why we're all struggling to try and grasp precisely what it is. Um, but it was it was exquisitely beautiful work. And I, I guess one thing, because we've had a series of these um, uh, uh, of presentations by um, uh, Akim and, and Philippe Bullock and so on over the time. And, and what I think what is interesting is that, is that is that all of you in some way have recourse to some existing system, whether it's kind of the, the vaulting of King's College Chapel or some natural system. And our extrapolating from that is almost like nature knows better than we do. And uh, I, but there was a commonality there. and, and a, and a real elegance in, in all your solutions. Um, uh, I just, I guess, my question was: I mean, it was was it, it all seems too good to be true, shall I say? Um, and I, I <laughs> like that that, uh, that glass bridge that you're putting together. But I remember going to a lecture by Eva Jerichner, where um, and she did a lot of glass staircases for in um, in London. Um, and each time she put them up there, they obviously they had metal connections and things, but the the, the the kind of the vibration thing would leave a little pile of of glass dust underneath, a very neat pile under each of the things. And I just I just I mean I think that I you know I'd love to see that, but I, I and I, I just wonder what challenges you're gonna face um in trying to to fabricate that. I mean well but the, the glass bridge particularly is is the most challenging project that we've had so far. So it's been it's been going on for the past two years and and um even three years I would say. So um yes you're right. Uh, well glass is one of the most challenging materials that that but it's in the meantime is as one of the most uh, promising materials for architectural spaces because all laser architecture is about transparency um, and basically open windows, etc. So it, it receives a lot of attention. But 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 working with glass, I hear you. It's 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 really hard. So what I'm um, going to talk about, I did not include here because again, that by itself requires a, a whole lecture, and that's a work in progress. I hope that soon I would be able to finish the. the, the we are actually working on a prototype three meter glass bridge as as a proof of concept, so we can move on to a ten meter glass. But one thing we understood about glass, if you want to really deal with the glass, because it's, it, it has a structural load bearing capacity, but in the meantime, it's very brittle, right? So this actually took us back to what nature does, right? So what nature, if you look at your bones, the bones are basically transferring the forces uh, of the body, right? So either gravitational forces or other forces exerted in the body. The, the, the bone itself has a very brittle structure and material. What happens is that there is a softer material, like a ligament, transferring the force from this uh, basically brittle material to the next. That's exactly what we reached after two years of working with glass, that we were looking for a ligament type system that can transfer the force from one glass element to the next glass element. Mm -hmm without basically, this is very tricky because that, that actually took us a long time to, to figure out what material we can use because the, if the material is too soft, then the entire system would actually have a huge deflection and would collapse and you would have a huge vibration as you move on top of it. So this is not really useful. If it's too hard, it would become as close, it would become very close to the glass, it would become brittle. So it's not a really good, a good thing to take the vibration and transfer the forces effectively from one sheet of glass to the next. So it took us a long time to, to, to basically figure out what material to actually use. And, uh, and this, is, this is the key. Eventually you look at it and say, okay, if you want to compare it with nature, well, yes, we could have used the same approach as nature did, right? Like, why didn't we just come up with that nature in, immediately at the beginning? I don't know. We had to go through a really, really difficult type of by finding different shear connection, et cetera, et cetera, and suddenly telling us none of this is going to work. And you have to simplify everything into some solutions that you can already find from nature and translate it into material and do the research in the material to see which one works. But I, but I hear you, it's, 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 a, it's a really difficult thing, but, but we, we, we learned that if you want to take advantage of the structural property of a glass that is 
most challenging material and it's most brittle, you have to be gentle. <laughs> you have to you have to develop a detailing that that can receive that um, uh, basically brittility in, in a in a gentle manner. So uh, it's very interesting for your glass bridge uh, research. If possible, maybe next year in digital next uh, 2022 digital futures workshop, uh, we, we, we we would like to invite you um, to maybe construct a small uh, glass bridge uh, in the workshop. Uh, if, the, <laughs> if the traveling policy is okay, we would like to invite you to come to Shanghai uh, to teach uh, in the workshop and uh, give lectures here. So uh, very, very interesting research and also the details matters uh, for the glass bridge. We have a professor in the engineer school of Tongji and she actually graduated from um, um, uh, University of Stuttgart um, for the Lightweight, Lightweight uh, Institute. And she is very good at glass, <coughs> uh, glass structure, actually. And uh, she participated in the consult consultant team for Apple Store, um, uh, all the Apple Store. Right they, they're working closely uh, in, in, in the glass uh, structure. That's a very specific uh, research field uh, because uh, the performance of glass is, is, is very different, different to the, the other exactly. material. <laughs> It's great, very interesting research for a bridge project. And we're looking forward, um, you can set up um, or establish um, this method to make a bigger, bigger uh, bridge in the near future. But the system is quite interesting. Yeah, by the double layer system. Yeah. Any other questions? Mm. Masoud, I want to ask you a question that was put to Philippe uh, Bloch this morning because he was uh, describing this elegant design and um, we had someone from Lima, Peru. We have got people from all, all over the world watching right now. And this guy said, uh, he said, we just had a 6.0 Richter scale uh, earthquake this morning. Would your bridge stand for that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, it's, it's really interesting. But uh, so... Um, so dealing with earthquake load, if that was the question, right? So that's not easy, right? Because it's a dynamic load, the system is not designed for it. What is interesting about the system that Philip uh, has been developed and working is that usually those funicular systems work really well uh, with respect to earthquake because um, it might be related to the center of gravity and how the center of gravity actually moves due to, uh, due to the um, uh, the acceleration of the earthquake, but they they perform really well. But maybe it might be also related to the double curvature nature of the work that uh, that he's doing. So somehow the structure finds a way to distribute the forces within the system. Um, in our system, we have not uh, basically checked the earthquake performance of our, our work, but um, so I don't have a proper answer for your for your question. Um, we just tested for. Um, for the for the hydrocrete project, the, the, the branching system, and in that project, the, the earthquake was uh, we applied the, the common earthquake loads and, and observed the, the behavior, and shockingly, it was it was very well. But again, I cannot really draw a conclusion to the entire work that we're doing. So um, it's not the, the 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 seismic behavior is not really clear to me. What is interesting is that. Um, the systems, generally, the systems that are designed using different form finding techniques, either form, uh, either basically graphic aesthetics or dynamic relaxation or, or any other like a, um, a form finding method, um, they behave relatively fine. And I don't know why. Uh, probably we need more basically analysis in that regard. But uh, but. Again, my intuition tells me that we are getting closer to how nature basically builds and, and works with the structure and distributes the material. And, 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 and we can learn from the nature after millions of, millions of years of evolution. It seems to be, it seems to, to, it seems that the nature follows more or less the same rules. Obviously the, the, the forces that nature deals with are, are really, really big. There are so many forces that are invisible to the human eye, but, but the result that we are getting are getting closer to what nature builds. And, and the behavior, it can be predicted that 
that can be actually better, right? Compared to the forces that nature is dealing. So, but, but super interesting question. Uh, <laughs> I don't know the, uh, the exact behavior. Good. So any other question from the floor? Gustavo, would you like? <laughs> and Virginia, actually your research, Virginia is my PhD student. She is right now making research on the leading uh, 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 fabrication technology and doing quite a fantastic uh, job. Uh, I think um, um, uh, Monsat will be a very good advisor. We can invite uh, to, to participate for your future, future research actually, because uh, the graphic stack is really a very good uh, special methodology to rethinking on the meeting uh, structure system. Virginia, would you like to have any question? No, I don't have any questions at this time. I just have to say it's really beautiful work, Masood. I, I think that it's always really amazing and it always makes my mind spin with the ideas that I can think of to work with uh, tensile knitting structures and deployable structures that's in my research with this kind of uh, structural performance that you're doing. So amazing, thank you so much. Thank you, good luck with the, with the research. I'm looking forward to seeing some of the works. I'm Masu, sure can I just say one thing? I, you know, I, I, I really appreciate, I, I taught for a while at the University of Bath where there were these engineers and architects and uh, we put together a, this conference, Digital Tectonics, uh, where we had uh, Cecil Bauman and a few other people, in fact, Mark Barry and so on. And we had Aki Mengers in the, in the audience, which is, he was still a student. But you know, the, the way the problem at Bath was that they didn't realize the kind of, there was a disjunction. There was a school of architecture and engineering and uh, like Chris Williams, who is one of the greatest geniuses we have, you know, in, 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 in the world of structural engineering, the students just would go up to him to ask him how, how deep they make a beam for their garage extension. And, and they, you know, I think the real problem about architects is, is that they, and I also, I was studied at Cambridge and the, the School of Engineering was right behind it and there was no communication at all. Um, later on, I worked with Christina Shea, who was teaching there, but no one in architecture knew who she was. And I think it's really important to have this kind of this interface between architecture and engineering. I, I know that Penn has been very good because Cecil Bauman has been there. And to see it kind of like as not as an afterthought, but as a kind of way of working together. You know, to my mind, you know, we have to design things in, together with with engineers, not to bring them in to make the thing stand up. So I, I, I must say I'm very impressed by the work that Howe was, How, How was producing and showed us the other the other the other day. And I didn't realize it, you were behind all that as well. But uh, I think that's a really positive thing to have a school of architecture and engineer. And did you train as an architect? Architect or an engineer? Which one? I guess is an I, architect. Right? I was both actually. Yeah, I was no, both. I think that's, yes, that's, that's, a, that's a really, really healthy um, outlook. So, um, no, I, I, I'm just blown away by the work. It's exquisitely yeah. beautiful. Yeah. I think we're really jealous to um, University of Pennsylvania because um, my school actually we we try to find some uh, very special researchers like you. Uh, uh, who have both uh, the background of both uh, architecture and uh, structure engineer. That's extremely important to integrate the parametric design in the future uh, because um, uh, uh, the structure, the gravity is very important as a material in research in this discipline. Exactly. So exactly. Uh, I, I think uh, uh, you will be the rising star, the future star in architecture. <laughs> Because wow. your is so amazing, so interesting. I think I'm looking forward to see what's happened next. A lot of possibility, so many possibility. And uh, you're, you're thinking in such a deep way. Uh, we need time to understand every project from your team. So sometime we need several months to understand what you're doing. But I, I think that's, that's the quality of your research. Um, it's a very... <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. There's there's one question uh, I can see actually here in the in the, in the chat. It says that um, what changes ahead in your research um, is uh, is in AI, quantum computing, intelligent materials. Um, well, artificial intelligence more or less is almost everything, right? So you see it uh, the application of machine learning. Is happening in many places. Frankly, when uh, when Howe wanted to use machine learning in his PhD research, I was a little bit 
doubtful because I was not sure. The same questions happened at the beginning. So how we can really go a little bit deeper than just image processing and, and how we can relate that. So I hope that he can, he can basically develop something meaningful for the research that can go beyond that level. I'm, I'm, I'm really looking forward to this. But, but definitely intelligent materials and, and uh, materials that can be programmed to do what we are trying to do uh, right now using the form work and false work, that should be the future and will be the future. So we can imagine that in future, I hope, and this is uh, one of the goals of the research that we're currently doing um, uh, as part of the team of uh, University of Pennsylvania, Princeton, Rutgers, and, and Rowan, which is called the future of manufacturing. And we're trying to eliminate the use of form work for future so we can program the material from micro scale to perform in macro scale. So basically you've seen many, many self um, uh, assemblies and many basically self-forming uh, system that uh, are happening in, in very uh, small scale and micro scale, but there is no application in larger scale yet. So our goal is that to bridge that gap to see whether it's possible to program in micro scale and expect behavior and see performance in macro. And um, probably, yes, I remember that the, uh, Achim showed some of the example of his work related to the bending wood, obviously smart material. So the question is that, can you also make a synthesis, uh, synthetic material uh, except wood? Is it possible to program any other behavior, just the bending, can you do other things? I think that should be, and that would be, at least from my perspective, uh, the future of research. But yeah, we'll see. Good. Very interesting. So I think the, the culture in University of Pennsylvania have you uh, and your team um, and also have some other, uh, like Aruham still there, right? Um, Aruham is there, yes, yes, um, yes. Um, and I, I, had an, I had an opportunity uh, last semester to teach AAD studio um, uh, that is directed by him. Uh, mm -hmm. it, was, it was very intense, but we used exactly the same methodology for timber design. Um, and we used exactly the same methods and techniques of, of, of 3D graphic aesthetics. But again, mm -hmm. the idea was not to really generate optimized structure, but to use it as a generative tool, right? To how we can actually push this idea further, to, read, to understand the relationship between um, topology and, and geometry, and then how we can utilize that further for the design of efficient structures. But it was it was an intense, but it was a it was a good um, good studio. <laughs> Great. Great. So thanks a lot to uh, to you, and uh, thanks for your contribution and the generosity to introduce all this high advanced uh, technology to the global audience. So um, I think um, that's the time is almost okay. Thank thanks a lot uh, to your participants. We are looking forward to your future. Thank you Thank so much. You. I really appreciate the invite. It was a great honor uh, again to be among all these researchers who were my mentors and basically uh, the superstars. And I, I really appreciate uh, the invitation. And I hope that we can actually catch up uh, soon in, in the future and then we can have more um, in depth conversation with so many other, <laughs> on so many different topics related to architecture. Uh, yeah, exactly. So I Thank want you. to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, try to uh, say tonight we also have uh, Matter uh, Thompson um, uh, from CETA give another fantastic uh, uh, lecture. So welcome back and eight, nine hours later. Bye bye to everyone. Bye bye. Thank you. Neil, thank you and talk to you soon, hopefully. Merci, merci. Merci, merci.